Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. We are going to start now. I'm aware we, are, we have people across different time zones join us for today's important webinar. We are welcome to this global webinar today, which will be on the, on the COVID-19 digital certificate. This is actually the first webinar on this topic that has been organized by DICE and uh, co-hosted by the WHO and UNICEF. To accommodate people from different time zones, we have actually split this webinar into two sections. The first section is actually what we're about starting now. And the second section will actually be held tomorrow, at, uh, which will be starting 8 a.m. UTC time zone. So for those that are not able to join today, they can actually join tomorrow. It will actually be the same content that will be delivered in the two sections. And for today, we have uh, speakers from different organizations that will be speaking about you know, different topics around COVID-19 digital certificate documentation. We have speakers who are experts in the field from the WHO, the UNICEF, as well as speakers from country offices. We will be sharing country experiences on the documentation of the uh, COVID-19 uh, digital certificates. My name is Sonny Ibeneme. I'm a digital health specialist working with the UNICEF East Asia Pacific Regional Office, Bangkok, Thailand. And um, before we start, please uh, let's have some you know, housekeeping rules. Uh, please remember to be on mute if you are not speaking. And remember to use the Zoom Q&A chat box to type your questions as the presentations are ongoing. We actually be taking you know, the questions at the end of the entire presentation. So do well to chat, type your uh, questions using the chat box as we proceed. And without uh, wasting more time, please, next slide. Without uh, wasting more time, I'm going to actually walk us uh, through what we are going to cover today in today's webinar. We will actually start with an opening uh, remark, which will be delivered by Dr. Karen. Next, we have experts you know, come and walk us through on some of the ethical considerations and justifications for establishing the COVID-19 digital certificates. Afterwards, we'll highlight uh, some of the technologies and policies that are required for establishing the COVID-19 digital certificates, as well as you know, someone else will run us through the minimum you know, requirements and data elements that are involved for deployment of uh, these important you know, certificates. Then we will have uh, key experts you know, from DICE you know, tell us about the global technical assistance and resources, including support that's available you know, to encourage, uh, to help countries you know, uh, deploy these uh, digital certificates. Then we will now have uh, the country experiences from you know, uh, experts from the countries. So without wasting so much time, I will be calling on Dr. Karen to actually give us the opening remarks. For your information, Dr. Karen is a senior health advisor and chief of digital health and information systems unit in UNICEF health programs. This includes operationalizing the UNICEF digital health approach and supporting the dedication, the identification, validation, and scale up of digital health innovations, such as equitable coverage of vaccines, maternal and child health services, as well as adolescent mental health. She is the co-founder of, of UNICEF-led uh, COVID-19 Digital Health Center of you know, Excellence. Dr. Karen, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sunny, and welcome everyone who's joined the call, this webinar, this uh, morning or evening, depending where you are. Um, just a few notes from me to say um, that in the, the space of uh, digital health, we have seen a remarkable increase of systems inspired by, by the COVID pandemic that now collects information on individual clients um, on, a, on an individual basis. And we saw an, also a unique drive among global good solutions and donors to cater for the vaccine rollout prior to their actual existence. And, in, and investments took place such as uh, COVID vaccine modules for individual tracking um, in DHIS2, in, in ComCare, in other solutions. We also saw sort of upfront investments in solutions like the, what we will hear about today in the, uh, on the DIVOC, which were pre-designed to sort of cater for vaccine certification. And with this now expansion of individual registries for clients' vaccination status, the, the step is not very far to, to, to move towards um, a certification module whereby individuals who have been vaccinated can show on their phone or on a smart paper with a QR code if and when they were receiving their vaccines. 
And so what we see a lot of um, uh, demand from countries now taking place is that there are primarily three use cases for this, these requests to have digital vaccine certificates. One, one uh, such use case is to be able to open up economies. We've seen this in a number of countries, including here in, the, in New York, that um, the, having a, to be able to show a vaccine certificate is mandatory to be able to open up, to be able to enjoy going to cinemas, to museums, to, um, to restaurants. We also have seen uh, other uh, opportunities whereby these digital vaccine certificates can open up for traveling and reduce the need for doing, doing PCR tests or quarantining. Um, we also see some countries even looking beyond COVID to, to see how these types of digital vaccine certificates can be expanded beyond COVID vaccines. And there are already inclusions of uh, other vaccinations happening in these certificates like the flu shots or even countries thinking about how to include EPI and routine immunization in these vaccine records to be, create sort of a, a home-based record type form of vaccination proof. So with this webinar today, we, we will be hearing from the experts who have been working really tirelessly to develop the frameworks around what uh, a COVID vaccine certificate uh, looks like and what it takes to implement this at country level. Um, we'll hear from, as Sunny was saying, we have our, our colleagues from WHO who has been leading that global uh, framework working group, and we will hear from colleagues from EGAP Foundation who has developed a solution that um, they are offering to countries uh, to support the deployment of this um, certificate. And I will come back later um, to talk about the resources and opportunities for technical support for this type of deployment. So which, uh, with that, I'll hand... And we can get going. Right. Thank you so much, uh, David, uh, Karen, for that excellent you know, welcome introductions. And colleagues, you are going to start right away you know, with the presentation proper. And first on the list, you are going to call on Nat to, to take on the floor. Nat is a technical officer in the Digital Health and Innovation Department at WHO and based in Geneva. She is responsible for coordinating the SMART guidelines and she works with internal and external partners at WHO. As part of the pandemic response, NAT has coordinated you know, the work related to publishing guidance on digital documentation of COVID-19 certificates. However, prior to joining WHO, NAT actually worked in strategy consulting across multiple sectors, including health and public service, financial services, products, and many others. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and a Bachelor of Sciences in Business Administration, all both from the University of California, Berkeley. She has a Master's in Public Health in, in International Health from the famous, health, uh, from famous John Hopkins you know, University, United States. She will actually be leading section with uh, Dr. Carl, and Carl is also a technical officer with the World Health Organization based in Geneva. He is a technical director of Digital Square, at PATS and an Associate Director of Health Workforce Informatics at IntraHealth. Carl brings more than 20 years of experience in informatics, information technology, software development, and education, and more than 14 years of designing and adapting health information systems in low and middle income countries. Carl has worked closely in a variety of roles with many uh, digital health global goods. Carl also engages with, international, with health informatics standard development organizations. He has led numerous workshops, you know, working with in-country teams to build their capacity to implement and manage interoperable health information systems and to make use of their data for effective decision-making and health policy purposes. Carl, who's a BSc in mathematics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and also a PhD in mathematics from the University of Arizona. So I'm um, welcoming on board, Nat. Afterwards, Carl will take the floor, please. Nat, please. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Sunny, for that comprehensive introduction. Um, if we could get to the slides, I think, I'm not sure if, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so first, I just wanted to start off by outlining essentially all the, con the context and challenges when it comes to digital documentation of COVID certificates. I think 
at face value, it seems like a pretty straightforward thing, right? Everyone just wants a certificate showing that they've been vaccinated or showing that they have a negative COVID test result. Um, but in order for that to be recognized globally, it is quite challenging to ensure that that happens well and digitally. Um, so at the global level, there really is an inconsistency in terms of data collected and interoperability standards that are used. Um, and that's what we are trying to do with the guidance that WHO has published. Um, but it's also quite challenging to do that because they're consistently changing policies following the evolving science. Um, as we get to know more about vaccinations, their effectiveness, um, whether or not they reduce transmission, for example, as well as testing strategies to reduce quarantine times and things like that. Um, and then I think very much at the global level, the reason why it is so challenging to have a standard set of interoperability standards adopted as well as a means of verification is simply because global standards really require global cooperation. Um, and so it really means that people have to essentially agree to cooperate and agree to use the same standards and agree to have the same trust frameworks in place in order for the digital technologies to then work. Um, and so now with at the global level challenges and the lack of that global cooperation at this point, a lot of governments are faced with numerous competing products. There's a lot of vendors out there with solutions that quite frankly do work and work well, but they don't necessarily work well everywhere. Um, and there's a lack of criteria for assessment for those solutions and there's not clear specifications and governments basically need to choose between a number of standards that have become up to kind of dominate the market, so to speak. So I'm sure all of you have heard about the European Union's DCC, as well as ICAO's VDS-NC. Um, and there's also the Smart Health Cards framework out of the US. And so those kind of trust frameworks that governments now have to choose between, um, or maybe they have to choose all of them and try to adopt all of them, which then um, really is challenging in terms of investments because all these COVID certificates, as well as other investments that have been made into digital technologies during COVID, really do need to be aligned with existing digital strategies and existing solutions. Otherwise, it might end up being a one-time thing, and it might end up being a sunk cost investment, for example. And so all that leads to individual level of challenges, where I'm sure all of those in the call right now um, who've had the fortune to be vaccinated um, we'll have a COVID certificate, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're able to use it everywhere in the world just yet. And it very much is still possible to obtain fraudulent paper digital certificates. And there's also high confusion about when, where you can use it and the policies behind all that is quite clear. Um, next slide, please. And so the objectives of what we at WHO are trying to do with the implementation guidance and technical specifications is really to ensure that we publish implemental implementable specifications and standards for data representation, functionality, privacy, and national trust architecture use cases to develop guidance detailing governance considerations, ethical considerations, and best practices, and to ensure that the design of it is in a format that's accessible to all and does not increase the digital divide. Next slide, please. And so quickly to note that Digital documentation of COVID certificate guidance documents has been published for vaccination status. So that covers two key use cases. One is continuity of care. So ensuring that each individual will get their subsequent doses or are able to understand whether or not they need a booster dose. And then the other one is the proof of vaccination. So this I think is the more talked about use case in the media where you need COVID certificates to either enter public spaces, go to restaurants, travel um, and whatnot. And that's kind of one guidance document and that's um, already been published in August of this year. And then we have another DDCC document regarding test results. So this could be negative COVID test results or proof of previous infection, which is identified by a positive COVID test result within the last six months or X months, depending on the member state. Um, and that I think is a very clear use case of just providing proof that you've been tested and the test result is either negative or positive. And we've released a call for public comment a couple of weeks ago. Um, I can put the link in that chat, um, but essentially we're still working on publishing that guidance document, but it will essentially build off of the vaccination status document. Next slide, please. Um, so we've outlined a list of key design principles based on ethical considerations and privacy protection. I won't list all of these out, um, they are in the guidance document, but I think some key ones to highlight is really that equity has been in the forefront 
of our work and the, the design principles that we use. Um, so that means that the format, it should be available on digital, but it should also mean it's available on paper. So paper with a QR code printed on it, for example, to ensure that countries also aren't locked in to any individual vendors. Because I think right now, especially in an emergency situation where countries are eager to open up economies again, there is a lot of risk that countries will essentially adopt technology that will end up costing them and their taxpayers quite a lot of money. Um, and I think the other one, which is not often talked about, is ensuring that the technology we do select is as environmentally friendly as possible. Given the proliferation of technologies surrounding vaccine certificates, I think it's important that countries do consider when they invest in a specific technology, whether or not there is an impact on the environment. For example, there are a lot of blockchain-based solutions out there in the market right now. Um, and that isn't necessarily a good strategy, especially in a resource constrained environment where electricity, for example, isn't always as widely available to begin with. Next slide, please. And so just to see what it looks like, and this will, the same principles apply for the test certificates. Um, so it's essentially specifications that support paper first augmented by digital based solutions. So a handwritten paper certificate um, with a QR code on it with a health certificate unique ID, or it could be a PDF, for example, or it could just be an app on a smartphone. Um, and this is really just to differentiate from what is mostly known as the yellow card right now and the National Immunization Home Based Record, but it is built off of those pre existing paper based systems. Next slide, please. And so just to clarify what's actually in the document. So the requirements and specifications include business processes and workflows, clarification of what the use cases are, the core data elements mapped to the terminology code systems, a list of functional and non-functional requirements, an overview of how to sign the digital certificate with PKI technology, and then an HL7 fire implementation guide to provide the interoperability standards. And my colleague Carl will go into that a bit more um, in a bit. And so in addition to that, there's also the implementation considerations. So data protection principles, ethical considerations, and national governance considerations. Next slide, please. Um, so I think it's important to note that once these guidance documents are in your hand, there's still a lot of work that countries will need to do. Um, and why we're here. So countries will still need to choose the modalities to implement their COVID certificate, and they will need to understand where those linkages will need to be made for the point of service solutions actually registering an individual for a vaccination, for example. And then I think the third one is really critical is to ensure that governments are actually implement the policies necessary to support the issuance of them. I think as you can see now in the media with vaccine certificates, there's a lot of um, fear from people and rightly so that vaccine certificates can be used for surveillance, mass surveillance of the population, which without the necessary policies in place and without the technologies built to protect that privacy, um, it definitely is possible to do that, right? Um, so countries need to make sure that policies are in place before deploying any sort of technology. And then other two key things is that there needs to be a mechanism for unique identification. We don't determine or prescribe how to do this. So it's important to the MERS state to determine how they want to uniquely identify individuals and whether or not they actually want to link that to the certificate. And then lastly, the trust framework, again, is really critical for ensuring that if you want to implement a certificate that's recognized by another country, those agreements need to be in place and the um, modes of engagement need to be in place before deploying that solution. Next slide, please. Um, and so here is where I'll hand it off to my colleague, Carl Leitner. Carl, over to you. Thanks, Nat, and thanks, Sunny and Karen. Um, um, so what we want to do in, in terms of the the digital documentation for certificates is um, look at um, first the the vaccination certificates um, and um, here that vaccination certificates is only documenting vaccination events um, so whether you've received your a first shot a second shot possibly a booster um, uh, but for the two use cases that Nat had referred to earlier, this document can also be used for um, routine immunization. So it does provide a, a history of vaccination for COVID. Um, we should also note that the infrastructure and the standards that 
um, are identified for COVID vaccinations can be extended um, for other vaccination um, so that a, a child or an adult may receive. Um, the, the digital documentation of COVID certificates, in addition to this, also documents the lab test results um, in the history of previous COVID-19 infection. It is only the test result. It's not a full test report. Um, so it doesn't provide any kind of clinical guidance or information beyond the, the results of the test. Um, and finally, we want to ensure that the information that's carried in these um, certificates can be used to support the development of a personal health record. Um, one of the ways that we do this is through the uh, leveraging the International Patient summary standard. It's a HL7 buyer standard, which provides a, a summary of patient information. Um, and we ensure that there's consistent data model and representation between the COVID certificates and the IPS. Um, uh, the IPS, the International Patient Summary, includes other health events, risk factors, allergies that might be considered um, relevant in the, the care scenarios related to COVID. Next slide, please. Um, and we, the DDCC, the Digital Documentation and COVID Certificates, does fit in with an existing ecosystem. Um, and there's several COVID certificates in the marketplace. There's the EU um, DCC, which we've mentioned, DIVOC, which we'll hear a little bit more about later, Smart Health Pass, uh, sorry, Smart Health Cards from the VCI, and LAC Pass, among others. Each of these has a QR code specification for how you represent that data, as well as a um, information about establishing a trust network to share these QR codes and ensure that these are not fraudulent. The WHO DC, DDCC specification provides an umbrella for each of these um, different um, QR codes. Here um, in the DDCC specification, rather than the QR code being a, a primary um, artifact, it, it's the HL7 FIRE document. HL7 FIRE is a um, set of international standards for health information um, and um, being recognized and used in increasing amounts across the globe. Um, the data model that's in the FIRE document is um, what we take upon um, as the, the, the core aspect of the DDCC. And there's a data model for vaccinations as well as a data model for uh, test results. Um, under this document, we uh, show how to link to the various QR codes from the, the existing initiatives so that you could have within this document both the EU DDC, the, a DIVOC, a smart health card, or whichever um, specification that's in use in your country. Um, the other thing that we're working on in terms of trust networks is a, a federated um, regional and national trust network. Um, that's work in progress. And the intent is to adopt and generalize the EU DCC gateway and to allow that, um, uh, which is their trust network, to allow more flexible um, arrangement um, for the sharing of public and uh, keys that are used to sign the documents and the QR codes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when in the DDCC's specification, we spend some uh, a fair amount of time describing the various actors that are involved, um, the software actors that are involved in the generation of a certificate, as well as the, the storing of that um, and, and status checking of it. So on the right hand side, you see a digital health solution, which might be um, used in a facility or a community setting to capture vaccination status or record lab results. Um, once that information has been collected in the digital health solution, um, they can send a vaccination event or a test result event into a DDCC generation service. And this is the, a service that exists um, uh, generally at a central level um, that will take the health information and sign it um, uh, and represent it in the HL7 FIRE standards. It has an, two things that it can do. It, can, um, it must store it in a registry service, which is uh, doesn't actually store the content, but stores metadata about when the certificate was signed, um, has it, the certificate been revoked for 
whatever reason, um, for example, a bad vaccine batch, an issue in the supply chain, um, or a fraudulently created certificate. Um, and then optionally, it can store the that DDCC document in a repository for retrieval later. Um, it's not required because of um, data minimization and, and um, some countries may not uh, want or have desire to set up a central registry of, of a repository of health content. Um, um, at this point, a status checking application can either do an offline check um, of the information using the the QR codes um, uh, uh, from the EU DIVOC or others, or it can go to the registry service to uh, and an online status check to validate that that um, DDCC document and associated QR codes are still um, considered valid and haven't been revoked. Next slide, please. Um, as we develop the DDC specification, as well as a reference implementation artifacts, which we'll come to in a minute, we kept in mind um, the need to, as much as possible, leverage existing infrastructure and architecture in countries, whether they're um, already deployed or being planned for. So we really look to open HIE as a way to structure um, um, uh, the, the specification. Um, so the digital health solutions that are uh, we're collecting um, vaccination or um, test results are on the bottom um, of this diagram. The certificate generation service would act as a mediator or service within um, the interoperability layer in, in green. Um, and then um, at the top, we see the, the various registry services, terminology services, facility registry, health worker registry, and product catalogs that can be used to validate information about uh, the, that is in the DDCC certificate. Um, and the, the DDCC repository where uh, we optionally store that information is filled, fulfilled by the shared health record. Um, the two sort of external services that are added to this are the national PKD, so the, the trust network um, for the public key infrastructure, as well as the DDCC registry. The reason why the DDCC registry is slightly outside of the um, the both inside and outside of the, the open HIE framework is that it can act both internally for um, continuity of use case care use cases, but it can um, interface with external member states or outside of the jurisdiction and, and sort of plays a, a role that's um, outside of the, um, the health information architecture. Um, we're developing um, training materials um, and financing project management guidance, capacity building efforts um, along uh, these specifications and, and their utilization within this framework. Next slide, please. Um, I think just wanna conclude with some um, timelines. So we have the guidance document out um, for vaccination status that was published in August. Um, and there's a fire implementation guide already available. We'll put the links in the chat to some of these links that are in the slide presentations. As Nat mentioned, the test result um, is out for public comment. Uh, that is um, ending on um, November 29th. So please review and provide your feedback. Uh, your feedback will make it stronger um, and to share in your networks um, so we can um, make sure we get a full representation and uh, uh, on how to um, uh, improve the, the test results and insurance um, applicability and, and usability. Um, the estimated publication for this is towards the end of January. We also have reference implementation and tooling um, that's already working for vaccination status and is being modified for the, the test results, including the certificate generation service. Um, uh, it's already available and we'll have the test results again with the January 31st approximate timeline. We have um, started the DDCC gateway for the public key infrastructure and public key directory, generalizing the EU. Um, we'll have a beta expect at the end of the year, as well as a universal status checking app where you can scan a QR code. It'll determine which of the types of the QR codes it is, whether it's the EU, DIVOX, smart health cards, or others um, using the uh, Google Android Fire SDK. Um, and we have a um, 
uh, reference implementation of the report health events, so the digital health solution available for open SRP fire core working for vaccination. Um, finally, just want to highlight there's a connectathon in January um, that will um, look at the interoperability between the DDCC, C, the International Patient Summary, and Smart Health Cards. Next slide. Thank you. Um, and back to you, Sunny. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Carl. And uh, thank you so much, Matt, for that excellent uh, presentation. We are happy to hear you walk us through some of the policies, the requirements, regulations, including some of the you know, data elements that are being required you know, for uh, establishing the digital certificate. We are happy to hear this from you know, the technical experts. And so colleagues, um, you're welcome to type your questions. I know you have you know, lots of questions for them. Use the Q&A you know, chat box for that. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we are going to take the questions to Carl and Nat. And um, I'm ha also happy when he said, DVOG, you know, is actually one of the you know, digital certificates in the marketplace for which uh, uh, today we have uh, colleagues from the DVOG team who are going to give us you know, further in-depth you know, presentation on DVOG so that we are able to understand or conceptualize some of the you know, high level technical discussions Carl and Nat has presented. So I'm going to welcome on board you know, the DVOG uh, team to come and you know, run us through some of the details you know, that we need to know regarding DVOG and how it's been you know, rolled out and scaled in countries. And I'm going to call upon uh, Pradip, Pradipta to take uh, the floor. Uh, but colleagues, before Pradipta comes on board, I want you to understand that uh, Pradipta naturally leads the health missions at e-government, which builds, on, you know, builds and maintains the DVOG. The DVOC is an open uh, source platform. As she is a software professional with over 23 years experience. Uh, Predator in the last five years had actually co-founded a tech nonprofit you know, that actually pro um, focused on, non on technology heavy lifting for grassroots organizations based mainly in India. She has worked on service delivery improvement by the government hospitals in tribal and underserved areas of India and has led an open source software community. She's a strong supporter of open source technologies and has led and anchored two popular open source projects which focus towards the social sector. Prior to that, in her last job, uh, Pradita actually you know, works with ThoughtWorks uh, in India, which is a global IT consultancy firm where she played various roles ranging from large software delivery projects to exploring the possibility of IT to profit health to underserved areas of the world. She has worked with relevant you know, international and local NGOs and government in multiple countries. Devo, uh, Pradipta, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you, everybody, um, for giving us this opportunity. Um, so can you just bring up the slide or do, do you want me to present my slide? I think we have a colleague Anu that is sharing the slides. Sorry, or you can me. project. I can, yeah, let me do okay, that. Good, please go ahead. Okay. My screen. Oh God. I'm sorry. I don't know what, what's going on. Stop. Give me a second. I can share with it, but just give me a second. Just give me a second, please. Is my screen visible? Yes, please. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, quickly, a little bit about us, who we are, uh, e-governments foundation. We've, we was, we've been working for over 
uh, sort of 20 years in primarily in urban transformation um, and open all open source technologies for urban transformation in India. Uh, we started by, you know, stalwarts of the IT industry, um, Nandan Nilekani and Srikanth have been, you know, they've run uh, large uh, IT services companies in India and was also instrumental in the um, identity project in India. Um, our foray into health, sanitation and in public finance are new um, and are, you know, the most recent one being, you know, health which we started uh, you know, during the pandemic when we thought that we needed to do something in health. Uh, what we do, we build, no, we don't not only build the public digital platform um, like Divoc and other platforms, uh, but we also work with the governments on policy standards, you know, anchoring institutions, several of our other digital public goods have now been institu institutionalized in India, you know, with anchoring uh, institutions at the national and subnational level. And what the other thing that's a, that's a, you know, a challenge in the market is that you know you build the digital public goods, but then you need to have a robust, you know, good, vibrant um, community and uh, ecosystem around it who's going to implement it. Uh, so that's something that we have been playing a convening role in, in doing, at least for India. Um, so uh, what's DIVOC? Actually, you know, we, it, it's a play of words. It's COVID backwards. And you can tell because, you know, we were born during the, the COVID days. And the idea was born is that, you know, people, countries need uh, digital infrastructure to be able to populate uh, sorry, vaccinate, you know, people at such large scales, which haven't been done before. So uh, that's where the idea was born to build the digital infrastructure starting in India. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we have been able to provide as a digital public good is around the certificates. But DIVOC has like four core modules where, you know, it has the ability to set up registries and the whole setup for the last mile delivery of uh, the vaccination or any public health program. It also allows citizens like in India and several other places where citizens can themselves register and, you know, and uh, sign up for a vaccination. Um, and, you know, last but not least, it's the certificate module. We are continuing to strive to be the digital platform that supports all emerging specifications. We started off uh, creating aspects of our own with India. At that time, unfortunately, the uh, you know WHO EDCC wasn't there. But we've been, uh, you know, it's been great to have this kind of a standard specifications now that we can comply with. Uh, we are also EU DDCC, uh, EU compliant, and we are soon going to be. Uh, compliant with the smart uh, smart health card uh, specs as well. So if we talk about the DIVOC certification itself as a service, you know, um, the certificate has itself a whole bunch of services that we can we can see. And this has evolved over time. So the first obvious one is the generation of the certificate, right? And uh, like Sunny said, we are very, very aware, and you know that it should not, uh, it should not exasperate the digital divide. So the DIVOC certificates are available through all kinds of medium, paper, digital, uh, etc. Um, but once you have access to the the certificate you you would need some way to verify it so we have the verification services in in india um, which is both online and offline you also have the ability to what we found out is that you need the ability to be able to correct uh, or revoke certificates as well so those services are also built in we also have a dashboard for the certificates for policy, you know, for you know, administrators to 
uh, know how many certificates are being generated, how many are getting revoked, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this has already uh, been tested at scale in India where we recently uh, have generated a billion plus certificates in India. Um, as you know that we, we celebrated a major milestone. Um, and even in Sri Lanka and in Philippines, I see our colleagues at Philippines who we work closely with, um, they have, they are slowly ramping up the generation of the uh, certificates. The other thing I wanted to call out is that, you know, we've been talking to some countries and, uh, you know, the, the issue that there is that any QR code is not secure. Like Carl talked about, you know, the, the whole trusted networks, the, you know, the whole security is built into Divoc. So it's a very highly secure um, QR code and not just any, any QR code. We also have services in India that are where, uh, around privacy, where you don't have to know you know, the details of the person, but there are services available where it just gives you information uh, about whether the person has been vaccinated or not, just the status. So that means that, you know, you're not sharing the, the persons, the individuals, uh, complete data. Uh, yeah, so like, you know, we are, like I said earlier, we're already live about a billion plus uh, vaccines. We are also in India using Divoc to, to roll out the COVID test, at, uh, test results certificate. Like uh, I think Nat said, there is in India also, we're seeing a lot of fraudulent test results. Uh, the, you know, the PDF files are very easy uh, to edit. And uh, so we've start. Uh, the government has rolled this out as a service as well. Um, we are uh, already live in Sri Lanka and Philippines, and soon we will be going live in Indonesia and Jamaica as well. We are actually doing a full stack uh, pilot of the last mile administration in Ethiopia with about hundred sites. Uh, Ethiopia is also planning to use the DIVOC uh, credential certificate for the entire, you know, the, for the country. We are having early discussions with Ethiopia and Kazakhstan um, on the vaccination certificate itself for COVID. Um, so in, in terms of working with different in the countries, um, what we see is that one thing is, you know, that each country has a lot of, like I think uh, Nat mentioned and Carl mentioned and Karen mentioned, there are service delivery platforms uh, and we've worked with integrated with most of the popular ones. We've integrated with DHIS2 in Sri Lanka. We're in the process of integrating with Comcare um, as the service delivery for vaccination in uh, Jamaica. And these are all uh, sort of, uh, you know, standard open, uh, open source uh, uh, adapters. Um, and even in Philippines, we are, uh, we have integrated with the different kinds of uh, their in internal tools as well. So what kind of support we give to the country? So we have, we see that we're, there are sort of two tracks uh, on the supports that countries, uh, we give them. One is obviously, you know, on the certificate generation platform itself, right? Like, you know, what kind of data, how does the certificate gonna look like? How's gonna be the signing process? How, are they, how is it going to integrate with the, the last mile uh, vaccine delivery uh, platforms or paper-based systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we help them create an implementation plan, help with the customizations, integrations, et cetera. We help them set up, we teach them, uh, you know, on deployment, on, you know, how to plan for their uh, infrastructure, uh, based on, you know, upcoming needs and growth. So that's on the technology track. Um, 
but we also see that there is there is sort of this this is an open space and we see that there are with so many different standards emerging i think there is a lot of support that the countries need to understand what these standards are how are they different um and you know what does it mean really in terms of you know what is what how do we ensure that the certificates are mutually accepted um what are the policies what are different countries doing um this is another big area which is you know where which we sort of because we are in the middle of it um we sort of end up doing a lot of this as well um rajesh do you want to add anything uh, no, uh, go ahead Pratham. So uh, on an average, it's been a quite a lightweight process. Uh, on an average, the entire process takes about four to six weeks if all the sort of dependencies are being met, which is you know the uh, you know procurement of the infrastructure, deciding on what the format of the certificate is going to look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think having dedicated partners have. In, in places where there are have really accelerated the implementations. Um, I think there is a need for you know to handhold and and support the countries. Uh, right now, a lot of the uh, support that we are giving is very you know we are, we are helping them um, do the implementations. And what we are seeing is that you know we probably need to come up with training programs uh, so that you know we can we can help the country sort of take ownership of of the services themselves uh, so some things that we are working on we're working on you know building out uh, simplifying the way that the you know these configurations and implementations can be done uh, but we are also looking at how do we create a more uh, a, a global implementation partner network, um, and we will continue to support and guide on on whether it's tech and tech plus policy to help countries to make sense of of all of this. Um, that's it from our side. Any questions, or the questions are going to come at the end, right? Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pradita, for that excellent presentation. And uh, please, uh, Anu, can you help us share the slide? For us to take the last part we actually running out of time yes so thank you so much uh at this juncture college you are going to be taking the last part of this um, presentation and this is actually dr karen who will come and give us you know what are the global you know technical assistance and resources that are available out there for countries regarding this topic uh karen please if you can take five minutes for this that would be great because we are actually running out of time karen the floor is yours um Okay, next slide, please. So I don't know if these are the right slides. Yes, that is better. We can go to the next one, yeah. So while, while we find the right slides, um, I'm going to talk about a, a, a support mechanism that has been established to countries who are looking for the ways to introduce digital solutions for COVID pandemic response, as well as the vaccine rollout. And this is what we call the, the DICE, the Digital Health Center of Excellence. It's a, it's a collaboration between WHO and UNICEF, where we have set up sort of a uh, a partnership, a mechanism to be able to provide this agile, flexible support to countries who are requesting um, technical assistance. And this was established in a, about a year ago, knowing that many low-income countries and middle-income countries are under severe stress with the rollout of the vaccine, as well as just the management of the COVID pandemic. And we knew that if we if we introduce and scale digital so digital health and digital technologies um, in a way that is sustainable, 
we would be able to see much bigger um, health benefits and benefits to the health systems more broadly, rather than doing this in a in a non systematic and, and rushed way. Um, next slide, please. So DICE is really set up to be able to ensure effective COVID vaccine rollout and equitable coverage of health services guided by data and evidence. And through DICE, we, we do this by um, looking at digital solutions specifically for COVID, but how they can also be uh, set up in a way and introduced in a way that they can support health services more broadly, including the vaccine delivery, but also maternal and child health services and nutrition investments. And we are doing this through um, existing structures. The support we are delivering is not uh, sort of a new parallel work stream, but it's really trying to work within our existing regional and country networks and structures using a, a team of technical experts who can provide this support. And it's not a funding mechanism per se, but we do have sort of initial support to be able to um, deploy technical expertise to countries who have reached out for help, who can come in and, and um, work with countries and, and colleagues at country level to um, do the groundwork and, and the, the, the costing of deployment plans and implementation plans for digital solutions like the COVID vaccine certificate. Next slide. So some of the priority areas that DICE supports, um, I don't know if you can click again, there's a click on it, yeah. So just to show that out of the many priority areas that we are supporting the vaccination status and the digital certificate is one of the areas that DICE can um, support with and provide resources to. And uh, we do also, of course, support many other areas for the COVID vaccine rollout, like the track and trace, a barcoding system, like digital micro planning using GIS, um, using digital platforms for uh, community mobilizations, etc. Uh, next slide. And just to show how DICE is set up, we have a core team of partners of this DICE consortium. We are currently funded by uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, by Gavi, by uh, the German Corporation, and um, uh, USAID as well have uh, seconded support through Digital Square. So um, we do meet with all these partners on a weekly basis to discuss alignment at country level to, so that if we hear of a country request, um, DICE can provide the technical assistance and then we can discuss with the other donors to see who has resources to be able to support funding of some of these deployments. Next slide. And the, the way we operate in countries is that we, we, we provide support around a number of areas to establish the, the needs for a digital solution. And that includes doing sort of the ground, laying the, um, understanding the, the landscape that exist in the country, which, which digital solutions are already in place that can potentially be adapted for COVID vaccine rollout or collecting individual vaccination data, for example. We're doing readiness assessments using standardized tools to understand um, sort of the, 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 the readiness both at policy level, at uh, human resource level, IT infrastructure level, et cetera. And then we can support with business analysis and deployment support of these solutions. Next slide. Um, and Pradipta was saying like the, the vaccine certificate can sometimes be uh, done in three months. And this is, this is a rapid timeline also for some of the other, uh, but basically just to show the steps that we work through, um, not just for the COVID vaccine certificate, but for other digital platform is to start with that needs analysis and really identifying the problem statement, the, assessing the, the the stakeholders involved at country level who can who can support uh, the doing the deployment readiness, understanding the contracting mechanisms on what partnerships are needed to be in place, MOUs, etc. To, for example, partner or contract a digital solution provider, and then to um, formulate the recommendations for how to go forward. So it can be a fairly quick process um, uh, if the problem area is clear. Next next slide. 
So if a country is interested in reaching out for this type of support to, to take a digital solutions off the ground for a specific use case, they can write to this DICE email address, contact at digitalhealthcoe.org, and we will start a country consultation. And um, uh, that's the best way to sort of initiate the conversation. I think that is my last slide. Yeah, thank you so much. Right, thank you so much. Um... Karen for that you know, excellent presentation. And colleagues, we are on the top of R. Uh, this section meant to be, next slide please. We are meant to go into the uh, Q&A section, but as I've announced earlier, so colleagues had actually you know, intelligently typed in their questions you know, on the Q&A box and uh, Dr. Carl had also responded to those questions. And I'm sure what we're going to do now is to you know, compile this, you know, the, both the slides, the recordings, the Q&A you know, that came out of this and other materials and make sure we you know, make this publicly available to participants that you know, actually joined this call today, as well as people that were able to make this call today. And also uh, we have another section coming up tomorrow uh, so that colleagues that were able to join today will join tomorrow. It's actually the same content, the same speakers and also the same presentations, but just for colleagues from other you know, time zones of the world to be able to benefit of these you know, timely conversations. Uh, the Q&A section, we already have them. So I'm going to document that and make that available to us. So I don't want us to waste you know, uh, longer than had scheduled as colleagues had other you know, meetings and other you know, things to attend to. So with that, we are going to, next slide please. We are going to take the you know, final uh, closing remarks from Dr. Devi, who is actually the Chief Organization Specialist at UNICEF here at uh, East Asian Pacific Regional Office, Bangkok, Thailand. Dr. Devi, please, you have two minutes so that we can you know, end this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, my apologies for not putting on the video because uh, it, uh, the function does not seem to be working um, uh, on that one. Um, so again, I just wanted to um, uh, thank um, DICE, WH and UNICEF and other partners for putting this a webinar together um, and, and really appreciate the, the, the thought provoking um, and rich presentations um, from the panelists as well. Um, and as you know, DICE, WHA, UNICEF and other partners are on full swing to support countries to access and roll out the COVID vaccines to strengthen the coaching capacities, counter misinformation, um, and issue verifiable dig digital uh, vaccination certificates, um, uh, as well as other important areas um, of the COVID response. Um, and as you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered an unprecedented demand for digital solutions um, in screening populations, tracking infections, minimizing direct um, human contact. And I, I just would like to echo this um, concept of the COVID-19 vaccine digital certification um, um, emphasized by the president presenters um, and, and also being discussed at the global level. Um, we've discussed um, the, the, about the, uh, the determination to build more uh, resilient health systems and to ensure that the gains that we fought for um, long and hard um, do not actually slide back. And there is an increased demand for countries to provide digital um, COVID-19 vaccine certificates. Um, and this rapid scale up um, um, of this digital transformation could be further adapted for routine immunization as presented earlier and broader essential health, uh, health services in developing this in, um, to more resilient health system. And there needs to be um, uh, great thinking going into that, uh, planning going into that, um, not only for the COVID vaccination, but in terms of the longer term, uh, what else can this be used for? Um, so without further ado, um, again, um, I just would like to thank um, all the presenters um, uh, as well as the organizers of this very um, important webinar who um, have tirelessly facilitated these um, uh, discussions, um, the, the presentations and, and all the work behind the scenes um, uh, uh, actually. Um, and to the colleagues in WH and UNICEF um, who helped us uh, making, uh, make this meeting a uh, success. So again, thank you all for the excellent work uh, you're leading in your countries uh, and the country officers in supporting um, the, the COVID response in, in your countries. Uh, thank you um, for your attention. 
um, please stay safe and um, we'll catch up um, in the near future as well with an update um, on this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Devi and colleagues. Do have a great day and apologies for taking four minutes of your time. We reconvene tomorrow for tomorrow's session. Thank you and you have a great day. Bye-bye.